So today we'll be talking about uh, Burns situations. In this presentation, we'll cover the following points. We're going to first talk about Burns in general and how, what are they and what is the kind of harm they cause. Then we're going to talk about uh, emergency examination. We will apply the same uh, examination steps, A, B, C, D, E, that we talked about earlier last Thursday. And then we will talk about the need for fluid resuscitation, which basically uh, fluid resuscitation is uh, replenishment of fluids because of the loss of liquid. And then we're going to have to talk about the outpatient management. First of all, let's look at this diagram that shows what happens when a certain lesion or a certain area of the body is come into contact with a burn. Do you know what could cause burn? Fire. What other causes fire? Sun. Hmm? Sun. Sudden? Sun. The sun? Exactly. Sun. Chemical? So, uh, fire and sun is the heat, for example, or it's chemical, or electric, right? Electricity. Those basically the types that could cause fire. What happens when this, any of these things get into contact, we, three different zones are uh, established. The first we call it the coagulation. Coagulate means come together, shrink, stick together. And that's because of uh, what happens in the proteins, uh, in the areas that are in the contact with the cause of the burn. The second layer is this layer of stasis. And basically what happens here, we have a damage to the vessels, especially the small vessels that are available in this area. And in constant, in, 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 in sequence, what happens is we have lack of circulation in this area. We have lack of blood flow. This would result in what we call another zone, that's the hyperemia. And the hyperemia is the increase of blood flow in the lower layer due to dilation in the blood vessels. Nerves? Where, where's the nerves? Nerves is here in the dermis. So, and you're familiar with the epidermis and the dermis? Okay. It, how deep the damage goes, that what makes us make differences between different types of burns. First degree, second degree, and third degree. We'll, we'll talk about this later. First of all, the, what happens when uh, we are exposed to a bird? How, what is the skin first? Any idea? How do we define the skin? What is the skin? Is the skin a system? It's an organ? Is it part of the system? What is the skin? It's an organ. It's actually the biggest organ in our body. And it establishes a barrier, a barrier between the outside and the inside of the body. So whenever this actually, this barrier protects us from chemical, from thermal, biological, and mechanical factors. So when there is a burn, that means an area of this skin is now open. We have an open surface. This open surface will actually have different consequences. First of all, we will have a loss of fluids. A lot of fluids get drained out. We lose them. Water, electrolytes, proteins can be lost. Sometimes the loss is too big that could cause dehydration, or sometimes it may cause even an edema in certain areas of the body. If the burn is over 20% of total body surface area, TBSA, if it's over 20%, then we are afraid that this loss may cause a hypovolumic shock. Basically, we have a shock that's uh, resulting from the loss of electrolytes and fluids. Another thing, because we have an open area now, we have immunocompromised 
place, a place that is very convenient for infection. So there's a possibility that will grow infection. Another thing that could result in the translocation of the flora. So the translocation of the flora basically is the change in the areas that the bacteria will be available and that will make a ingestion problems. Another thing that would cause also kind of systemic inflammation and we'll see a raise in the inflammatory mediators. And that could cause on the long run a syndrome which we call this respiratory distress syndrome. So if we want to repeat the different things that could cause by uh, uh, by uh, the burn, what would we say? First of all, you need to be specific. If it's a small burn or it's a large burn, it makes a difference. First of all, what happens when we are exposed to burn? We have an open surface, right? We have an area that's exposed to the outside. Right? Could be infection if it's more than 20%, right? But once we are open, then we are prone to hypovolumic shock loss, big loss of fluids. We are prone to infection. We are prone to inflammation. We are prone to translocation of our bacteria or of our flora. Okay, clear? Respira uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome. Basically, because of too much inflammation, the, the, the respiratory will just has stopped, and the patient might uh, have the durations of not being able to breathe at all. And then this can go on for back and forth. Okay? And that is not related to any kind of inhalation injury that we're going to talk about a little later. It could happen just because of the inflammatory reaction. I told you before that the difference between pharmacists and other people is how we get uh, we pay attention to details. So I expect my questions to be paying attention to details. Okay. I'm doing the best I can. I expect of you the best you can. No compromises, okay? The best you can. Okay. So when we talk about assessment, we talk about A, B, C, D, E. Okay. So for A, we're talking about the air airways, and then B is breathing. We said there is a difference between assessing airways and assessing breathing. Anybody remembers from last time? What's the difference between breathing and it's a total? Airways any block in the. Exactly. So it's physical. And breathing, ability to breathe. breathing, the ability to breathe. So it's physiological. Okay. So we want to make sure that this person airways are open, so air can go in and out. We need to know about the history, and we look for suit or sinked uh, nasal hair. Suited means shaha means it's it's uh, that's the errors. Breathing, how can we tell that this person is breathing? We want to see how is the oxygen levels and if the oxygen is actually flowing. We can use uh, oximeter, pulse oximeter to measure the oxidation of this person. Now, uh, it's scratchomy. Scratchomy means sometimes in specific burns, we have the skin becomes so tough and so thick, the skin actually becomes a barrier for someone to breathe because it's too hard, it's not elastic anymore. So we make an incision in the skin, we open the skin so people can actually breathe, can actually move, their lungs can move freely. This is, we wanna see if this is indicated or not indicated. Is it affecting breathing? Is the burn affecting the ability for this person to breathe? We need to listen. If you remember from the previous course, we talked, no, no, it's on, I think it's on the third or the fourth level. You guys talked about different breathing pattern and how is that can tell you a lot about the patient situation. That's very important. And we need to assess the rate and depth. Can you tell me the difference between the rate of breathing and the depth of breathing? The rate of how many breathing 
how many exactly how many inhalations how many uh, in, uh, inspirations in for example one minute but the depth of breathing how long the volume how big it is how it's really filling the lungs the air C is for circulation how do we measure how do we assess circulation from last time what do you look at Blood pressure, heart rate. heart rate or pulse, exactly temperature. Right. Hmm? Temperature. temperature of the skin and the, the color of color the skin. skin. We're going to make sure that this, we need to establish an IV access. So we will be able to replenish, to provide back all the electrolytes and the water that this person has lost. And we want to see peripheral pulses in circumferential Burns. Why do we want to monitor uh, the peripheral pulses? Especially when this burns is in a big area around the body, because we want to make sure that this burn has not affected the peripheral circulation. Okay. Good. Okay. D is for disability. And when we talk about disability, we look at associated injuries. What could be an associated injury? From last time, too. He is burned, he ran, he fell. Trauma, a small trauma, right? He can't breathe. He can't breathe, so he uh, uh, have so, uh, uh, another kind of injury, like he uh, can't see uh, well, he cannot uh, move his hands, there's another problem other than just the burn itself. CO, what's CO? Uh, carbon monoxide. What's the problem with CO poisoning? Why do we care about carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide? And once it is actually attached to the hemoglobin, it's irreversible. So the longer this person is exposed to carbon monoxide, that means the harder it is to bring him back in normal. And that's what we talked about the golden hour from last time, if you remember. Hypoxia means, oh, substance abuse. Do you know what substance abuse was? A lot of people think of substance abuse like taking drugs, So, But that's not only substance abuse. Substance abuse could be anything, could be smoking, could be drinking, could be uh, any other habit that can affect the level of oxygen that this person will have. Hypoxia? Increase the level of oxygen. Exactly, increase the level of the pressure of the oxygen and pre-existing medical condition that might make this injury worse. I need to know about this too. Now let's talk about exposure. We need to expose this person. So we need to take off any clothes, any in, uh, any jewelry that they may be wearing. Not the stuck one, but you know the loose one. We want to make sure that it's warm because this person could be, first they are exposed, and the other thing, they might have a hypothermia because they lost a lot of fluids, correct? So we use blankets and then if we want to extinguish the fire, if we want to stop the fire, we can put some water, but we want to make sure that the water that we are adding is not compromising the temperature of the body. Clear? Looks okay. What can we do for the stuck clothes or something? Blisters? Stuck clothes. Stuck clothes? They're stuck? You just have to leave them. And then after, leave them on, because you don't want to make it worse. And then you can get them first with greens, make sure it's loose. And we will see, depending on the level of the uh, burn, you can actually take the skin off, the dead skin off. And then you can, if there's a dead skin, you can take the clothes off as well. For the secondary uh, survey, we have a primary survey and we have a secondary <laughs> survey. So the secondary survey, First of all, we repeat the primary survey, the A, B, C, D, E that we learned. Then we need an HPI. Have you looked at the pharmacotherapy book ever? Yeah. You, we have this book always, right? HPI stands for History of Present Illness. 
تاريخ الحالة الحاضرة أو الحالة الحالية أو المرض الحالي أو شو معنى هذا الكلام؟ What does that mean? No, that means what have led to what happened now. How did this happen? So we're going to see what type of burn. Is it chemical? Is it scalding? Is it flames? Scald means more, more electricity. Duration of exposure. How long this person has been exposed to the burning factor? What treatment already provided? Chemical brushed off. Did we have a dry cloth and took the chemical off? Did we put some water to stop the burn, to stop the fire? What did we do? Did the burn happen inside an enclosed area where there is exposure to fume, or was it in the outside? We want to look at lab and x-rays too. Why do we need the x-rays for? Why do we perform x-rays? Because we are, especially to the chest, x-rays. Because we want to make sure that there is no damage to the lungs have occurred. Right? This is very important to check any possible. Um, another thing we need to conduct certain uh, lab tests like CBC, which is complete blood count. Complete blood blood count. count. We want to make sure that this person does not require BUN, blood urine, blood nitrate, creatinine, all the electrolytes. We want to see the percentage of the carboxyhemoglobin. We want to see the blood gases. Basically, the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 and CO. When you see, insert the Foley, see if the airways are open. Tube. We want to see if the heart is doing well. And sometimes we need to consider other things that possible abuse patterns. What kind of community abuse for children and elderly? This person might be doing something that's abusing things, not using it properly. And we want to look at a possible trauma and see if we need to do a C-spine stabilization or if we need to check for a rapid trauma assessment and to see if this person has any broken bones, any problems, any bruises. We need to do that rapid trauma assessment that we talked about last time. Another thing that we need to measure, we need to measure the total uh, body surface area. Why? Because we want to know the percentage that this burn caused out of the total body surface area. What is the percentage of out of the total person there? There are many use ways of doing this. First of all, if you have smartphones, you can have a application called U-Burn. U, the letter U, B U R N. And what this application will provide you is with a human body, and then you can just touch the areas where the burn is, and it will calculate for you the body area, body surface area. That's called Uber. Another thing, we have it on the internet, it's called sagediagram.com. And with sagediagram.com, you can do the same thing over the internet, and it provides you with a full account of the percentage of area that had been affected by burn. This is very important because you will use this later on to actually make the resuscitation of fluids, the replenishment. A third way, if you have nothing, you don't have an internet access, you don't have a phone, you can use the palm, the palm um, rule, which says that each palm is actually 1% of the body area. So you measure by palm. This is the website. It's free to register, and you can use it freely after that. Sagediagram.com. Okay, now how do we pursue the treatment or the management? Very important to know the difference between treatment and management. And I think I told you that about that in previous class. What's the difference between treatment and management? Malfarq Baina. 
تقديم العنايه او تدبير المريض وبين معالجه المريض. Treatment is part of the management. صح؟ هي من المانجمنت. Yeah, certain approaches we call them as treatment. Whenever the burn is more than 10% of the total body surface area, we go on and do what? We do IV fluids, we do the IV resuscitation, fluid resuscitation. Very important to know how to clean the burns. We don't clean the burns with saline. We use hepiclin. We use more iodine stuff. And that's because the uh, saline will actually sting the person, will cause pain. We need to provide supportive measures. What kind of supportive measures we need to provide? Hmm? Oxygen mask. Oxygen mask, sometimes. Is the oxygen mask is just a flow, oxygen flow, or it's a high pressure? High because this pressure could be, pressure. depends on the, on, on, the, on the situation of the person. So we need to decide what approach we're going to do. Transfer or referral, and then sometimes we have to go through surgery. That's physician's work, not our work. Now, fluid resuscitation. We agreed that fluid resuscitation is due, and we have to do it when? More than 10% of the TBSA. So, more than 10%, 15% for adults. Why do we do it? Why do we need to provide fluid replacement? Why do we need to do fluid resuscitation? Hmm? Exactly, because we have a big loss in fluids, so we need to make sure that we make this up. How can we decide what type of fluid? Depending on what have been lost. So a lot of, as you can see here, many examples have been suggested. It depends on what we really want to do. Then Parkland formula. Is Parkland formula going to be on the exam? You bet it will be. Will I provide it? No. You have to know it by heart. Okay. So, the amount of fluids that we need to provide over 24 hour time, 24 hours, is equal to 3 to 4, and we'll see what decides whether it's 3 or 4, ml per kilogram per percent of body uh, the surface area that was affected by the burn. So, you need to know this, and you need to know the weight of the person in order to apply this formula. Now, we know the total in 24 hours. How can we tell over how, how, how much we're going to give, like the rate? So we'll do half of this quantity in the first eight hours, quarter in the next eight hours, and the last quarter in the last eight hours. So, for a mil, when is it recommended? When there is electrical energy, when there is a thick tissue burn, like third degree burn, then we go for four instead of three. There is a calculator, an online calculator. You can go on the Merck manuals, and then you can block in the numbers for your own. This is also available as a Okay. Scientific calculator as an app as well. You can download the app, so you can have it on your phone, so you can calculate the Parkland formula. In children, we don't only do resuscitation, we also provide what we call maintenance. So in addition to what we do in the Parkland formula, we add a maintenance fluid. And this maintenance fluid, the rate of providing this maintenance fluid will happen and depending on the weight of the child. So for example, for, for the first 10 kilos, we provide 100 ml of the maintenance fluid. For the second 10, we provide 50, and then 20 for every 10 kilos afterwards. So for example, if this child weighs 25 kilos, what are we gonna provide out of the maintenance fluids? 25, 25 kilos was one. Weight is 25 kilos. The first kilo, 10, 100. So? Second 10? 
150, so it's 150. The third is not a 10, it's 5. So how much do we provide? 160. 160 So you need to know this too for the examination. And to refresh your memory, and the rate is the same as the others. For Let's do this example. You have a baby with 20% burn and weight is 23 kilograms. First of all, you need to know what kind of resuscitation fluids. They suggested Ringer's lactate. Okay, what's the quantity? And this was no? 23, 23 times. Mm. So, uh, 3 ml. 3 ml, because it's a child. Yeah. 20%. 20 over percent, over 100, 20%, and that's basically the burn percentage. Right. 13, 18 mils. If I tell you what's the rate, how you're gonna give this person over 24 hours? This is 13, 80 over 24 hour time. Good. Right. The first eight hours, what are we gonna give? Half. 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 So 13, 80 divided by half. That's 60, 90. Second day to Quarters. Quarter over the coming eight hours, mm -hmm. and then another quarter over the coming eight hours. Okay, maintenance. 100. So it's dextrose, 5% in lactated ringers. That's going to be our maintenance. For the first 23, first 10, 100, second 10, 50, and then 3 out of 20 per kilo, right? And then we'll add up all this together. This will also come into the examination. In the exam, I may ask you not in the first eight hours. I will ask you what's the rate of providing this solution per minute? How many mil per minute? Okay. Exactly. I can provide you also with a possibility of giving you the weight in pounds instead of kilos. Five. Two point two. Exactly. So you just know, you have to know your conversions. Sometimes I will not provide you, or most probably, I will not provide you with the percent of the PSA, the burn. I'll give you this, and I will shade the burned area, and you have to calculate the percentage. Sorry. How about you? If it's the chest, trunk, out, if it's the front, it's 18%. So this is 18%. This one here is 1%, the palm. The head is 9%. Eight and 18 and 9, that's what, 24? 24. Thirty-two. We'll go now to the inhalation energies. Sometimes because of the burn, the most important thing that we are worried about is inhalation energy. So we are afraid of carbon monoxide poisoning, upper respiratory problems, and lower airways problems. Monoxide, carbon monoxide. We need first to check, how can we tell? We can check by oximeter, see what's the percentage of oxygen. We want to see if this person has any problems, any substance abuse. So we want to check if this person smokes, if this person has any problem, takes any kind of medications that could result in uh, relaxed uh, muscles that could affect the way he breathes or she breathes. Carboxyl monox uh, hemoglobin, carboxyl hemoglobin levels should be zero to five is the normal. And morbid symptoms, they appear after 10%, whenever it goes before 10%. Sometimes our diagnosis point is to see if there's any metabolic acidosis. When does metabolic acidosis happen? Hmm? Metabolic acidosis happens when there is an incomplete oxidation, right? An incomplete oxidation means there is a problem with the level of oxygen. So that could tell us that there could be some kind of poisoning too. Clear? These are basically the symptoms for carbon monoxide uh, poisoning. And 
this line goes as higher the mon uh, carbo uh, mono carbo uh, carbon monoxide levels goes up, the symptoms go worse. How can we treat carbon monoxide? We have two, um, two approaches. Whether this person is awake, then we provide oxygen by mask 100% until we reach a hemoglobin of less than 10%. If this person is obtuned, then we have intubate. But before we intubate, we need to learn about this person's history. You don't have to put anything in this person unless you know their allergies, their full sample account, sample history. We can provide 100% oxygen via uh, positive pressure, or can we have a high pressure? Overpressure in case this person cannot breathe at all. So we need to force the oxygen in, in order for this providing with oxygen. Upper uh, respiratory, how we uh, define upper. Anything uh, above the geta is upper, anything below is lower. So how do we diagnose this? We diagnose this, we diagnose this by providing a scopy. We usually that provide a, a direct laryngoscopy to look every, for any damage that could be possible in this area. This area is very important because if there's any damage here, there could be a problem with delivering the air into the lungs. Sometimes we need, depending on the level of the damage, we need to see if we need to have a tube that goes inside the trachea or no, it's okay, this person can breathe on their own and we can provide just a mask. Okay. So it depends how open this area is. For the treatment, entering the hospital, see if tubing is indicated, provide oxygen, provide bronchodilators. And with bronchodilators, we need to make sure what kind of bronchodilators we provide, you know? So and we need to provide also inhaled steroids. But inhaled steroids are only good if the burn is limited. If we have a big, a big burn, then there is a higher chance of immunocompromised problem, and the steroid will cause more infection, and then it will make the uh, problem worse. Exactly. That's a very good exam question. We don't release the patient right away. We usually wait between 48 hours to 72 hours because so many symptoms do not appear right away. They may last longer. So, as I mentioned about the inhaled steroids and the need of the tube to get in or out. Another thing is the lore. The lower means there is a problem with the tracheobronchial tubes, the lungs itself, and this is basically have a problem because a lot of time we can have certain fumes, certain uh, smoke, and certain particles that could get, could have got into the lungs. So we need to check for this, and that's one reason why we do the X-ray. That's one reason we do the x-ray. We want to check if there is any edema, if there is any slough, there is any problems that could tell us that this injury can be irreversible. And then we'll see, most probably, this person will need intubation or masking, depending on how bad the situation is. Sometimes we may need a scoring system to see the level of exposure to uh, fumes or chemical particles in comparison to the harm that was caused to the lung. This system is not yet done and hopefully one of you guys will get a prize for doing such a system. In a Nurbot, التي حدثت إلى lung إلى الرئال مع كمية الفيومز التي تم استنشاقها. This is not yet there, although it's very well needed to check the damage compared. Just the way that we saw in carbon monoxide, we have such a scale 
that we relate to. The higher the percentage of carbon monoxide, the damage, what kind of damage that it will do. It's a very nice clinical study. Someone is interested. The types of burns. Basically, we have three different types of burns I have mentioned, depending on the depth of the burn that goes through. This is how it appears. This is basically what are the symptoms, redding and blackening or grayish. That's how the scale goes. And this is the level of injury and the depth that it goes for each type of the burn. That's why we don't provide steroids to third uh, degree burns, as we mentioned before. Now we know the differences between the burn that was very sufficient. I think the video was very sufficient. Let's just talk about the treatment really good. So first degree burns, do they leave a scar? Redness. Or do they leave a scar afterwards? No. Yes. They are redness, but they heal fast, right? They heal faster and they can heal with no scarring. What do we need? How do we treat this? We just apply some kind of antibacterial to prevent possible infection. And that could be Bactroban or Bacitracin. And then just apply it to the area. Second, degree burn. We have three different levels. We're just going to talk about the treatment. The levels of the burns is how hard the skin gets and how deep further it goes. So uh, whenever we have uh, blisters, like this, that means we have a second degree uh, burn. How what we do about it? We first do that, we debride it. What do we mean by debride it? We take off the dead skin, but use an antibiotic. We need to clean it also by an antimicrobial. Only the skin that, only those that are cannot move the skin, uh, have problem with moving, those are the ones you're gonna take off. You take, uh, you clean the wound, and then you see if you can need to do a skin substitute or grading, uh, add uh, an extra skin from another place in case needed. Uh, the second degree, typical sylvadin, with sylvadin is basically another antibacterial cream, and make it occlusive. So basically, after we apply the cream, we take a piece of gauze chash and then we apply it on the cream we need to protect it but still we use gauze because we still want it to breathe and then a temporary substitute can be also provided then we have a deep second uh, degree burn we need to wash with antimicrobial salt silvadine and then as i said grafting is now more appropriate because most of the skin this is actually a skin that has been 
done grafting, uh, we added a different skin. We covered the burn with a different kind of skin. Then we have a third degree burn, antimicrobial soap with water, so the again, dressing and grafting is really more indicated. They're very close to the deep one. Then, but this is more initiated with the black to gray areas in the burned site. How about outpatient treatment? After leaving the hospital, after leaving the burn center, we need to, we don't let them leave unless they are less 10% of the TBSA, because above 10% we are afraid of infection and symptoms that may appear after two to three days. So these people need to stay in the hospital for two to three days. The scouts uh, do not have to be deep except in children. Scouts means what kind of burns? Electric burns, right? And then estimate the extent of the burn. What's the uh, percentage? And then look for the color of the burn to decide what degree the burn is. And the presence or the absence of blisters. Apply digital pressure and observe the capillary refill and provide pain killers, and then you can change the dress, the wound, and provide an antibacterial pain. This will end the presentation for uh, uh, today. So I. Uh,